you know, since um, the COVID epidemic, we've seen a major change in how we're treating pain. Um, a lot of visits have moved to telemedicine, um, which makes it difficult both for patients and physicians because pain management requires such a uh, dependency on physical examination. Um, but patients have more access to getting pain care because of telemedicine um, uh, utility. I would echo Dr. Shah's uh, sentiments. Uh, with nearly 20 million Americans suffering from high impact uh, pain, uh, which essentially limits their ability to live the lives that they wish to live uh, and function the way they want to. Uh, sadly, many of these patients are led to believe that medication is the only treatment. And like many others in my specialty, when I was practicing uh, as a pain specialist at the Cleveland Clinic, as well as in my own practice, I helped hundreds of patients successfully transition off of opioids with interventional pain management. One particular patient that comes to mind uh, is this lady who has had pain for 20 years, whose pain essentially was resolved completely with a single radiofrequency procedure, and she could have been spared 20 years of suffering. It is stories like hers that really illustrate the potential for, uh, uh, of potential of pain management with drug-free pathways and what I've seen in the last uh, nine months is that there is a heightening of uh, the crisis. So we've had three crises, uh, uh, particularly in the last uh, six months. And one is the opioid crisis, the second is the COVID crisis, and the third is the awareness, of cri awareness crisis. And what I mean by the awareness crisis is patients are not aware of their drug-free um, options, including interventional pain options. Well, like I said before, we're seeing a lot more telemedicine and telehealth services, uh, but patients still have a problem of access, of being able to be referred in a timely manner and seen in a timely manner to pain physicians. And what we're seeing is that patients are going to their PCPs or they are not trying to access pain care at all, uh, which is Again, another one of those epidemics that we're talking about. Um, in fact, the AMA recently wrote a report on this very problem that patients have a right to good pain control and they're not being able to access it, uh, particularly due to the COVID pandemic. From my perspective, the COVID pandemic has impacted every aspect of healthcare and pain management has not been spared. Nearly half of the patients reported that the pain worsened during the lockdown period. The pandemic has also made many patients wary of in-person doctor visits and procedures, signaling a need for more education and more reassurance of the patients about how best to weigh in their options uh, in the new environment. Patients uh, often um, have concerns that the hospitals and clinics are cesspools of infection, when in reality there are lots and lots of precautions that these clinics uh, and hospitals are taking and there is a dire need for education and reassurance of those. With regards to what Dr. Shah just uh, touched on, which is the digital health and telehealth, um, evidence suggests that patients with chronic pain are receptive to telehealth, with one study showing over 90% uh, patient satisfaction with telemedicine. And from the specialist perspective, a glimpse inside the patient's home, seeing how they're living their life, provides additional insights, a little like uh, doing home visits, which was uh, the norm in the 60s and 70s uh, 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 during my um, upbringing in England. Uh, so you get an insight into the patient's lives, specifically through the lens um, of telehealth medicine. Uh, and that gives you additional uh, potential uh, therapeutic uh, um, window in, in, into their life. Um, the other thing that's uh, noticeable is that the COVID-19 um, has accelerated the adoption of telehealth. And I think this may be the silver lining uh, in the whole thing in that as the pandemic subsides, I hope telemedicine continues because it is an efficient way of uh, delivering care, uh, both for the practitioners and for the patients. One of the things that we have learned through the COVID pandemic, and look, it has affected every facet of healthcare, but in pain in particular, it's unlike diabetes or high blood pressure in the sense that patients are actively suffering every minute of their lives, that they don't get pain care. So not having access or not being referred earlier to pain specialists who can treat the pain just prolongs the amount of suffering that's 
quite honestly, unnecessary. Um, and that's what we're seeing in the COVID pandemic. Um, you know, patients are unnecessarily suffering uh, because of access to good pain care. Um, you know, uh, it's a complicated uh, dynamic because on one hand, patients can't get referred to pain management specialists and cannot get the therapies that the amount of technological improvement we have in the pain therapies that we can offer patients are just are, have revolutionized, particularly over the last decade. Um, and so some patients are not able to get either those treatments or their opiate treatments. There, there is a fundamental um, issue with prescribing opiates when you can't see the patients, when you can't do your due diligence with the opiate medication. So there, there is that uh, stigma that's associated with both due to COVID and the opiate epidemic of getting patients the pain care that they really need. I think another thing that has not been um, um, uh, addressed is that both substance abuse and uh, overdose and deaths uh, have increased during uh, this pandemic as it did with the first SARS pandemic. Uh, the EMS is taking more calls. Um, uh, you know, if you compare last year compared to this year at the same uh, three month period uh, with regards to overdose and deaths. And this is a reflection of, of what Dr. Shah specifically just uh, addressed in that because of lack of access and because of our inability to really deliver care during the crisis, we're seeing more uh, consequences in our society uh, that we wouldn't have otherwise. I think we just described it. It's um, allowing patients to have more access to pain uh, specialists and pain care. Um, there are limitations to telehealth. It's not a global panacea for, for healthcare, uh, but it does allow patients to have more access. Patients seem to really like it. You know, they don't have to take time off of work and they can come um, through their computer or during their lunch hour and schedule a visit with the pain specialist. So I think patients are really um, um, taking a liking to the technology. There are some limitations. Like I said, we are a specialty that requires really specific diagnostic um, um, modalities, really di good diagnosis in order to treat your pain. So that there is a limitation there though. I would concur with Dr. Shah that uh, uh, telemedicine has really um, been uh, adopted well. It is liked by both the patients and the uh, practitioners. Um, it is an efficient way of delivering care in my uh, uh, mind. Uh, and I hope it perpetuates uh, well beyond the crisis. I think we're really getting to the crux of the issue with that question. Um, I am surprised in my daily practice how little patients are made aware of what are the options to treat their pain. Um, you know, they typically leave my office saying, all this time I had no idea that all of these options are available from a single injection to radiofrequency ablation to spinal cord stimulation. You know, we do a really good job of um, pharmaceutical marketing to patients, but I think there's a gap in, te in teaching patients what options, therapeutic options are available that are non-pharmacological based. And the reason I really stress that, I truly believe that there is a problem with polypharmacy in this country, where patients are on so many medications, particularly as you get to the seventh and eighth decade of life, that really we should be aware of what non-pharmacological options are, are available for patients and really stressing that and giving patients an awareness, giving patients uh, an opportunity to be more accountable for their health care um, by going to their pain specialists and say, hey, I read about this. I would like to learn more about it. Um, but typically that's not happening right now. The lack of awareness amongst patients and primary care physicians of how fast the field of interventional pain has developed continues to impede adoption of FDA approved and scientifically proven treatment uh, uh, and, and uh, diagnosis modalities as Dr. Shah just alluded to. Uh, in fact, uh, a 2020 survey showed 58% of the patients were not aware of drug-free interventional pain procedures. Um, and the question is, how do we create better awareness of non-opioid uh, pain solutions. And I think the first step really is to better understand the patient's chronic pain, 
asking the patients to rate pain on a visual analog score of zero to 10 is not relevant in the clinical uh, setting when we're taking care of uh, chronic pain patients. Uh, I think what is called for is a more personalized pain management approach that begins with the individual measures that could yield more practical results. Leveraging over 42,000 uh, data days of Boston Scientific's uh, collaboration with IBM uh, Watson Research using artificial intelligence, data analytics, machine learning, and uh, uh, deep dives into patients' uh, 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 behaviors uh, creates an objective measure that allows us to uh, render more personalized treatment uh, for these patients. And I believe that this improves our ability to find clusters of patients who are affected in a particular way uh, based on pain. And these insights create opportunities for doctors to identify chronic pain patients earlier and consider appropriate interventional pain solutions before starting opioids. Uh, indeed, patients receive treatments early um, uh, in their pain journey will have better outcomes. Uh, and I, if I may quote uh, an editorial by Rizrian Kumar, uh, quote, we have demonstrated the efficacy of spinal cord stimulation treatment in a time-dependent manner with success rates exceeding 80% if implantation occurs within two years of symptom onset compared to 15% for patients whose implants happen 20 years after the onset of patient's uh, pain. So as Dr. Shah said, we should be seeing these patients uh, earlier and we should be seeing every patient uh, with chronic pain so that they can receive uh, a more correct and definitive diagnosis and a more correct and definitive non-pharmaceutical uh, intervention to try to address their pain as opposed to allow it to perpetuate. It's a great question. Um, after the COVID pandemic, I suspect that patients will continue to use telehealth services. I think it's here to stay. I think patients will have a lower barrier in, in terms of getting access to healthcare. Um, no longer, like I said, you don't have to look for parking. You don't have to take time off of work. It's going to be a lot more um, facile for patients to acquire pain care. Um, but I'm hoping that after the COVID pandemic, when patients have not been able to go into the healthcare facilities and they've been unnecessarily suffering, I hope they realize the importance of being referred earlier to pain specialists or to pain management uh, because suffering is completely unnecessary. And so my hope is, is that after the pandemic, patients are more aggressive in learning what the options are for them um, and reaching out earlier and waiting uh, later in the spectrum. On the other side of the pandemic, I see um, nothing but hope uh, for our patients who have been suffering needlessly um, with uh, 19 to 20 million chronic pain patients with high impact pain, uh, of whom perhaps uh, a few of them actually end up getting the right treatment at the right time. Uh, so after the pandemic, I see many more patients getting the right treatment at the right time, uh, but they have to be able to access uh, uh, interventional pain management. Um, and we can do that with uh, many of the resources that we have, including uh, pain.com um, and including uh, Ready for Tomorrow uh, as an example because this will raise awareness for patients and colleagues in other specialties about drug-free pain options. And our virtual clinical education series, uh, which has uh, reached out to doctors uh, and give them and provided them with up-to-date information, will also hopefully help in this endeavor of uh, early referrals um, for correct diagnosis and correct treatment.